Welcome back my fellow Shield Brothers, it's the Shield Brother here for the History Armada once again with episode 5 of the History of the Germanic States. Before we get started for today, let's recap what we talked about last week. Last week, we saw the death of the Holy Roman Empire at the hands of Napoleon Bonaparte, and we saw the rise of powerful larger states such as Austria and Prussia, and how that would influence and affect the growth and evolution of the surrounding Germanic states. As well as, we saw the Enlightenment change the life for not only the nobles of the Germanic states, but also the peasantry. And we saw several revolutions, including the Lutheran and the Protestant revolutions at this time. So with that, let's get started for today. So the German Confederation. Europe in 1850 was a continent in a state of complete exhaustion following the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. And it started to turn from the liberal ideas of the Enlightenment and Revolutionary Era and to Romanticism under such writers as Edmund Burke, Joseph de Maistre, and Novalis. Politically, the victorious allies set out to build a new balance of powers in order to keep the peace, and decided that a stable German region would be able to keep French imperialism at bay. So, it was Napoleon's re reorganization of the Germanic states was that it was kind of kept, and the remaining princes were allowed to keep their titles. In 1813, in return for guarantees from the Allies that the sovereignty and integrity of the su southern German states, Baden, Württemberg, and Bavaria would be preserved, they broke from the French. And that leads us to the German Confederation, which you can see a nice map of on your right there. So the German Confederation. It was a loose association of roughly 39 states created in 1815 to coordinate the economic powers and coordination of separate German-speaking countries more along the same path. It acted as a buffer between the powerful straits of Austria and Prussia, and Britain approved of it because London felt that there was need for a stable, peaceful power in Central Europe, and that could discourage and be aggressive towards any moves made by France or Russia. According to a report from 1985, most historians have judged that the Confederation to be weak and ineffective, as well as an obstacle to German nationalist aspirations. It, rough, it, was, it was both beneficial but also very harmful for the Germanic states due to the fact that uh, although it did get the economies to kind of coordinate, it was a very hard buffer for the Prussians and other German Germanic speaking states to kind of realize their nationalism and kind of bring that back into a sense of a true unity if that makes sense and it collapsed b due to the rivalry of Prussia and Austria and the 1848 revolution and the inability of the multiple members to compromise in any way it was replaced by the North German Confederation in 1866 so what was the society and economy like that we were just talking about that they were getting coordinated? So the population of the German Confederation at this time, excluding Austria, grew 60% from 1815 to 1865 for its lifetime there. From 21 million to 34 million, the era saw the demographic transition take place in Germany, and it was a transition from high birth rates and high death rates to low birth rate and also low death rates, as the country developed from a pre-industrial to a modernized agricultural and supported a fast-growing, industrialized urban economic system. On your left there, you can see the railways of the German Confederation. So in previous centuries, the shortage of land meant that not everyone could marry and marriages took place around age 25. In 1815, however, it increased Due to increased agricultural productivity, it meant a larger food supply and a decline in famines, epidemics, and malnutrition. This allowed couples to marry earlier and have more children. Arranged marriages became uncommon, and as young people were not allowed to choose their own marriage partners subject to a veto by the parents. The high birth rates were offset by a very high rate of infant mortality and immigration, especially after about 1840 to the German settlements in the United States, 
This is the big period for the Germ Germanic states. We see a large epidemic, not an epidemic, but a large emigration to the United States. And that greatly adversely affects the Germanic states that we have been covering for the last couple episodes. And the upper and middle classes began to practice birth control. And a little later, so did the peasants. And that brings us to industrialization. Before 1850, Germany lagged far behind the leaders in industrial development, Britain, France, and Belgium. In 1800, Germany's social structure was poorly suited for entrepreneurship or economic development. Domination by France during the era of the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars, however, produced important institutional terms and reforms, including the, abolu the abolition of feudal restrictions on the sale of larger landed estates the reduction of the power of the guilds of the cities, and the introduction of a new, more efficient commercial law. Nevertheless, traditionalism remained strong in most of the Germanic states. Until mid-century, the guilds, the landed aristocracy, and the churches, and the government bureaucracies had so many rules and restrictions on entrepreneurship and industrialization that it was held in low esteem, and given little opportunity to truly develop in the Germanic states. But from the 1830s and the 1840s, Prussia, Saxony, and other states started to reorganize agriculture. The introduction of sugar beets, tunips, and potatoes yielded a high level of food production for the Germanic states, and which enabled a surplus rural population to move to industrial areas. The beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in Germany came in the textile industry and was facilitated by eliminating tariff bar barriers through the Zollverein starting in 1834. So by getting rid of these tariffs, they opened a new door for industrialization, especially in the textile industry as well as other industries, for entrepreneurship as well as more participation by the lower classes in industrializing Germany. And that also brings us to urbanization. And by mid-century, the German states were catching up to the high producers of France, Belgium, and Britain. By 1900, Germany was a world leader in industrialization along with Britain and the United States. But urbanization is an effect due to this industrial revolution within Germany. Industrialization brought rural Germans to the factories, mines, and railways. The population in 1800 was heavily rural, with only 10% of the people living in communities of 5,000 or more people and only 2% living in cities or of more than 100,000. After 1815, the urban population skyrocketed, due primarily to the influx of young people from the rural areas. Berlin, for example, grew from 172,000 in 1800 to 826,000 in 1870. So within 70 years, it grew over 700,000. Hamburg grew from 130,000 to 290,000. Munich from 40,000 to 269,000. Those are just a few examples of the urbanization going on due to the German Industrialization Revolution. And although you have to consider that there is a large emigration to the United States offsetting this growth, but that's besides the point, really. And that this uh, urbanization and this immigration was largely affected by the new railways. The takeoff stage of economic development came with the railroad revolution of the 1840s for the Germanic states, which again you can see on the map on your left. So the railroads were part of the industrial revolution in Germany, which opened up new markets for local products, produce, etc., created a pool of middle managers, increased the demand for engineers, architects, and skilled mechanics, and it stimulated investments in coal and iron. Politically, this unity of three dozen states and a pervasive cons conservatives, it was a very conservative, is what I'm trying to say, a group of roughly three dozen states, which made it difficult to build railroads and railways in the 1830s. However, in the 1840s, trunk lines did link the major cities. Each German state was responsible for the lines within its own borders, but nevertheless, all the major cities were now connected by a railroad. So, this, as I said, opened the door greatly. And that brings us to science and culture of this era, which is very 
widely affected by the different effects of 1840, etc. for the Germanic states. German artists and intellectuals heavily influenced by the French Revolution that had earlier ended and by the great German poet and writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe turned to Romanticism. In this era, in this episode, we see the rise of urbanization, industrialization, and romanticism for its culture after a period of enlightenment. Philosophical thought was decisively shaped by Immanuel Kant. Ludwig von Beethoven was the lead leading composer of romantic music at this time. His use of tonal architecture in such a way as to allow significant expansion of musical forms and structures was immediately recognized as bringing a new whole dimension to music of this era. His later piano music and string quartets especially showed the way to a completely unexplored musical universe and influenced people such as Franz Schubert, Robert Schumann, in opera a new romantic atmosphere combined with supernatural terror and melodramatic plots in a folkloric context was Ex was being successfully implemented in its in the Germanic culture for this time. It was achieved by Karl Maria von Weber and perfected by Richard Wagner. In his Ring Cycle, the brothers Grimm not only collected folk stories and the popular Grimm's fairy tales, but they greatly rose to popularity also. But they were also linguists, now counted among the founding fathers of German studies. They were commissioned to begin the Deutsche Wörterbuch, or the German Dictionary, which remains the most comprehensive work of the German language. You can see the Brothers Grimm bottom left. At the university levels, high-powered professors developed international reputations at this era for the Germanic states, especially in the humanities led by history and philology philosophy, sorry, which brought a new historical perspective to the study of political history, theology, philosophy, language, and literature, these being used together to better understand and grasp the new factors of these studies. And that brings us to its effects and the changes in religion. So two main developments reshaped the religion in Germany in this time period. Across the land, there was a movement to unite the larger Lutheran and smaller Reformed Protestant churches into one. The churches themselves brought this about in Baden, Nassau, and Bavaria. However, the Prussian king, Frederick William III, was determined to handle unification entirely on his own terms, without consolation. His goal was to unify the pro Protestant churches and to impose a single standardized liturgy organization and even architecture on these churches. The long-term goal was to fully centralize royal control of all the Protestant churches. In a series of proclamations over several decades, the Church of the Prussian Union was, pro was formed, bringing together the more numerous Lutherans and the less numerous Reformed Protestants into one umbrella term and one Church of the Prussian Union. The government of Prussia now had full control over church affairs, with the king himself recognized as the leading bishop. Opposition to unification came from the old Lutherans in Cilicia, who clung tightly to the theological and liturgical forms they had been, for, been following since the days of Luther. Like These are people who wanted to adhere strictly to the writings and beliefs of Martin Luther. The government attempted to crack down on them, so they went underground. Tens of thousands of them migrated to places such as South Australia and the United States. In the United States, they formed the Missouri Synod, which is still a operational and a very uh, proud and active uh, synod of the Lutheran Church in the United States. It's still in operation and is a conservative denomination. Finally, in 1845, a new king, Frederick William IV, offered a general amnesty and allowed the old Lutherans to form a separate church association with only nominal government control. So they kind of came to a halfway point with the old Lutherans. From the religious point of view of the typical Catholic or Protestant, major changes were underway in terms of much more personalized religiousness that focused on the individual more than the church or the ceremony within Germany. The rationalism of the late 19th century faded away, and there was a new emphasis on the psychology and feeling of the individual, especially in terms of contemplating sinfulness, redemption, and the mysteries of the revelations of Christianity. 
Peacetic revivals were common among Protestants. Among Catholics, there was a sharp increase in popular pilgrimage in 1844 alone. Half a million pilgrims made a pilgrimage to the city of Trier in the Rhineland to view the seamless robe of Jesus, said to be the real robe that Jesus wore on the way to his crucifixion. Catholic bishops in Germany had historically been largely independent of Rome, but now the Vatican exerted increasing control and a new ultramon Montanism of Catholics highly loyal to Rome. A sharp controversy broke out in 1837-1838 in the largely Catholic Rhineland over the religious education of children of mixed marriages where the mother was Catholic and the father Protestant. The government passed laws to require that these children always be raised as Protestant no matter what the mother wanted contrary to the Napoleonic law that had previously prevailed and allowed the parents to make decisions themselves. It put the Catholic Archbishop under house arrest. In 1840, the new King Frederick William IV sought reconciliation and ended the controversy by agreeing to most of the Catholic demands. However, Catholic memories remained deep and led to a sense that Catholics always needed to stick together in the face of an untrustworthy government that they felt existed within the Germanic states. So the politics of restoration and revolution. So after the fall of Napoleon, Europe statesmen convened in Vienna in 1815 for the reorganization of European affairs under the leadership of Austrian Prince Metternich. The political principles agreed upon this Congress of Vienna, including the restoration, legitimacy, and solidarity of the rules for the repression of revolutionary and nationalist ideas. The German Confederation was founded, a loose union of 39 states, 35 ruling princes, and 4 free cities, under Austrian leadership with a federal diet, meeting in Frankfurt am Main. It was a loose coalition that failed to satisfy most nationalists. The member states largely went on their own way, and Austria had its own entrance. So this German Confederation really wasn't confederated at all. In 1819, a student radical assassinated the reactionary playwright August von Kotzmer, who had scoffed at liberal student organization. In one of the few major actions of the German Confederation, Prince Metternich called a conference that issued the repressive Karlsbad decrees designed to suppress liberal agitation against the conservative governments of the German states. So, in after Napoleon, we see a lot of reactionary things going on, we see this loose German confederation, and we see students who are being radical trying to change things for themselves and the next generation, but ultimately being sm uh, smacked down by the conservative German governments. In 1848, growing discontent with the political and social order imposed by the Congress of Vienna led to the outbreak in 1848 of the March Revolution in the Germanic states. In May, the German National Assembly, the Frankfurt Parliament, if you will, met in Frankfurt to draw up a national German constitution to adhere to. But the 1848 revolution turned out to be unsuccessful. King Frederick William IV of Prussia refused the imperial crown, the Frankfurt Parliament was dissolved, the ruling princes repressed the risings by military force, and the German Confederation was re-established by 1850. Many leaders went into exile, including a number who went to the United States and became a political force there. In the 1850s, there was a period of extreme political reaction. Dissent was vigorously suppressed and many Germans immigrated to America yet again following the collapse of the 1848 uprisings. Frederick William IV became extremely depressed and melancholy during this period and was surrounded by men who advocated clericalism and absolute divine monarchy. The Prussian people once again lost interest in politics. Prussia not only expanded its territory, but began to industrialize rapidly. Here we see Prussia kind of kick into overgear in its industrial revolution, while maintaining a strong agricultural base. And that leads us to Bismarck taking control. So from 1862 to 1866. In 1857, the king had a stroke and his brother William became regent. The and then became King William I in 1861. Although conservative, William I was a far more pragmatic leader. His most significant accomplishment was naming Otto von Bismarck, you might remember my video on Otto von Bismarck a couple months ago, as Chancellor of Prussia in 1862. 
The combination of Bismarck, Defense Minister Albrecht von Roon, and Field Marshal Helmut von Moltke set the stage for victories over Denmark, Austria, and France, and led to eventually the unification of Germany. So this ob the obstacle to German unification was Austria, the rival of Prussia, and Bismarck solved the problem with a series of wars that united the Germanic states north of Austria. In 1863 to 1864, disputes between Prussia and Denmark grew over Schleswig, which was not part of the German Confederation and which Danish nationalists wanted to incorporate into the Danish Kingdom. The dispute led to the short Second War of Schleswig in 1864. Prussia, joined by Austria, easily defeated Denmark and occupied Jutland. The Danes were forced to cede both the Duchy of Schleswig and the Duchy of Holstein to Austria and Prussia. In the aftermath, the management of the two duchies, duchies caused escalating tensions between Austria and Prussia. The former wanted the duchies to become an independent entity within the German Confederation, while the latter wanted to annex them. The Seven Weeks War between Austria and Prussia broke out in June of 1866. In July, the two armies clashed at Sodova Konigratz, or which is in Bohemia, in an enormous battle of a very huge scale not quite seen in the European theater. And it involved half a million men. The Prussian breech-loading needle guns carried the day over the slow muzzle-loading rifles of the Austrians, who lost a quarter of their army in the battle. Austria ceded Venice to Italy, and Bismarck was deliberately lenient with the loser to keep alive to keep alive a long-term alliance with Austria in a subordinate role. Now the French faced an increasingly strong Prussia. So, Bismarck was a genius, and he was a very great real politic. And he, if you want to know more about him, you can go watch my earlier video on Otto von Bismarck. But he uses his wars and role to turn Austria from a rival into a very strong ally. And that leads us to the North German Federation. So the North German Federation formed in 1866, and in 1866 the German Confederation, which like I said was a confederation, dissolved. In its place, the North German Federation was established under the leadership of Prussia. Austria was excluded from this, and the Austrian influence in Germany that had begun in the 15th century finally came to an end. So we see the end of German strength, uh, Austrian strength, pardon me, and Austrian interference with German politics that has been going on since the 1400s end in 1866. The North German Federation was a transitional organization that existed from 1867 to 1871, between the dissolution of the German Confederation and the founding of the German Empire. So here we see the North German Federation. And if you turn in next week, we're going to talk about the German Empire from 1871 to 1918, how it came to be and how powerful and great this German Empire was that finally brings all these tiny and different Germanic states that have existed since before the Holy Roman Empire into one entity of a German Empire along with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So thank you so much for watching. Tune in next time to see the Emperor get crowned, and we'll talk about the German the German Empire. And I hope you liked. If you do, leave me a like. If you did not, go ahead and leave me a dislike. Let me know what I can improve upon. And as always, I'll catch y'all next time.